Thanks for coming. I hope you're having a great DrupalCon so far. Unfortunately, due to COVID regulations and me feeling under the weather, I can't join you in person. But thankfully, the organization was able to get me up on screen, which I'm super happy about. Uh, and also, they allow me to attend virtually to help answer any questions through the app um, with the live Q&A. So first things first, let me introduce myself. My name is Ronald. I'm a lead developer at Open Social, which you might know from our Drupal distribution. Uh, I'm working with Drupal now for over 10 years, uh, and I would love to share some of our newfound knowledge with you all. In this case, it even has a fancy working title, Project Cable Car. First, I would love to set the stage by giving you some background information, some necessary context for the what and why of this all. Uh, we will obviously dive into the multi and mono repositories. What are they? What's the differences? Our pain points and what made us reconsider our approach uh, and give you some of the learnings we got along the way. For those of you who are not familiar with Open Social, we build community engagement platforms, uh, basically digital spaces that empower your members to connect, share knowledge, and spread ideas. And Open Social is an open core product. It all starts with an open source Drupal distribution, which comes with all of the essentials you need for your community platform. This is available for you on Drupal.org or through GitHub, where we do our active development. As it is open core, we also offer a range of proprietary extensions. As we say at Open Social, these turn your platform into a powerful purpose built tool. We also do custom enterprise work on top of that, whether that's an integration with a one off custom tool you're using or a change request tailoring the community to your needs. In the end, it's all built on top of the open source distribution. So basically, that means you could see our open core and SaaS model as a layered sphere. At its core, we have the Drupal distribution. Basically, everybody gets this, it's always there. On top of that, we have a default setup, as I like to call it. It's basically configuration and modules, permissions, etc. as an extra layer uh, that all of our customers get. Uh, for example, our customers don't really need all of the capabilities that a site builder uh, in our open core uh, version might need. Then the next layer is the extensions marketplace. It's basically there for our customers to enhance the default product with extensions and tailor the community to to their needs and make sure that we solve their use cases. And last but not least, uh, we also do customizations uh, and integrations. And if you combine all of that, you basically have open socials, flexible, customizable offering. So with that context in mind, getting back on track, uh, multi and mono repositories, what are they? Both mono and multi repositories have one thing in common. They are a strategy to host and maintain your code base where a mono repository uses a single repository to host all of the code for multiple projects. A multi-repository has those projects in entirely separate repositories, whether that's Bitbucket, GitLab, GitHub, it's separate. So at first glance, the difference might not feel like a big deal, but the decision you're making will very likely have quite the impact on your development workflow. So let's take a little deeper look at these two. A multi-repo was the standard way of developing applications within open social and probably in a lot of companies. You know, a repository for each application or project or product logically split into its own project makes sense. It also gave a lot of autonomy, right? Teams could make their own decisions on what they needed to solve a specific use case within that repository. And it also came natural to us. You know, put a module or a set of modules together, solve a certain use case, get that in one repository, it basically screens what we do on Drupal.org. And be mindful, it also has a lot of benefits, regardless of what we're talking about today, that we went from multi to mono, there are a lot of benefits to this. For example, the performance, it's a very small chunk of code that you're working with, so it's easier to maintain. Uh, performance within an IDE, it's much faster. It's quicker to iterate, you know, from product owner or customer request to adding that value into your project, you don't have to really worry about the rest or any potential third-party library conflicts you don't know about. It's all external contracting that you have to deal with. So any conflicts for that matter that are now isolated in your code, instead of breaking down or grinding development to a halt, basically you isolate it into that repository and it only that repository breaks and not everything else. Also being able to tag individual versions for a project made you able to ship value fast, right? Once it's merged your work, it's tagged and released, you can basically deliver that value to your customer by that release. 
instead of needing to wait for the rest of the product. You can just release it at its own fast pace. Um, and of course, last but not least, as you're working per repository, you can also re easily revoke or add access uh, to the repositories and to those working on that specific package. So that's not really bad, is it? Now let's take a look at the Mono repository on the other side of the spectrum. It's basically set up to increase visibility and transparency. You're working in one repository together, so you can see everything that's going on from other teams, everybody working uh, in that repository. It basically by nature promotes collaboration. You also have the single source of truth. Everything in the main branch should work, right? Everybody's working from the main branch and it should work. Um, and you're releasing from the main branch as well. Every project or package in that Mono repository all very likely gets the same version once released. So you have a single source of truth, one commit tagged with a version that you can go and look back to. So you can see what's going on if something breaks. And if you're working in one repository for your projects, you can just set up your code quality standard for that repository and it will work and run for all of the projects inside of it. So you don't need to worry about having to update quality standard checks within every single project on its own. Your developers basically get a very standardized, consistent experience. And imagine having to refactor a big chunk of code across multiple projects, potentially opening up five pull requests or more over different projects, and having to worry about administration and planning and releasing. Now every project is in one repository, so you don't need five different pull requests. You can just fix it in one and make sure that you add the impact for the entire mono repo. Ultimately, it also helps with code sharing and dependency management, right? You have all of the dependencies in your mono repo, so you can ensure that if you update a dependency, you update it for all of the projects living inside the mono repo, or make sure that you can easily share code between projects. So I guess you can say that both of these strategies have quite some pros, and with that also some cons. Now let's take a look at how that plays into our product at Open Social. In order to maintain these layers of flexibility from a code repository strategy perspective, we need to dive a little bit deeper than this image uh, will, will tell you. Because what this image doesn't really show is what a typical customer from a code dependency management perspective or development perspective looks like and how our teams can work with that. So let's take that towards a typical customer in Open Social. Like I said, everybody gets the distribution. So we have a we have a version of the distribution installed, default configuration on top, and a given set of extensions. In this case, just five, but it could be any number of extensions. All of these extensions live in their own happy little private repository. And then using Composer, and in our case, private packages, we can install, update, download the dependencies as necessary for a specific version. All good. It works. Imagine uh, there's a new customer, customer B. They've almost got the same set of extensions. However, they also requested for some custom celebration notification based on the user's birthday. And who doesn't look, who doesn't like a good birthday party? In our case, the case of open social, that might mean that a developer first need to enhance the distribution, potentially with a new team component. The distribution is a new minor version. Then a developer needs to update the birthday extension with a new functionality. Potentially it's not backwards compatible, so they need to release a new major version. And finally, there's some customized work for that customer. Perfect. So we solved their request and we've added the value and we even enhanced the product at the same time. So why is this an issue? If you look closely to customer A, they have the Officer 65 integration enabled. And unfortunately, the work done in the birthday extension breaks the sync between Office and Open Social. The team working on the value for the customer missed that. They weren't aware of the integration in their workings. And now basically customer A is left behind and additional work needs to be done before they can update to the same version. But who does this? Where do we plan this? Is it the problem of the initial development or is it a product problem? Probably the latter, but how do we deal with that? Basically, after years of scaling and growing into uh, that situation, as, as we outlined just now, we, we've noticed quite some pain points coming from this. Uh, and I, I've noticed th three down for you uh, to try and summarize them. First, the development happened within an extension. While that makes the iterations faster and easier, 
it also means that the impact is noticed in a later stage. You know, it, it happens on the deploy. Um, and, and for the range of the entire product, any potential interoperability between the extensions or dependencies that needed updated were also only noted at a later stage. This basically led to estimations missing out complexity, quality issues because we needed to rush uh, compatibility work in. Um, and, and with these amount of extensions, uh, there's basically no real overview or ownership on who is going to fix it, how to deal with it, how to make sure that we know beforehand what's going on. Um, obviously, there are contracts, right? So we tagged it with a major version that will tell that there's something breaking potentially. But it's still very hard to make sure that you tell this and then still your own product is suffering from it at a later stage. Obviously, we grew to over 100 extensions. That by itself is already a challenge. Not all of these extensions are sales related. Some of them are enablers or helpers or wrappers. But you can imagine that these extensions themselves have dependencies. And you can imagine the pain coming out of that. You know, just look at that image that you see on the right. It's a dependency wheel of all the dependencies of our extensions and uh, our distribution. So basically all of the dependencies that we use, if a customer would enable everything, but they wouldn't enable everything likely, they would enable a subset. So it's really difficult to test that, combine that, make sure that um, everything is taken into account. And we grew into this dependency hell, so to speak, with none of the extensions really knowing or understanding what the other extension does. And it wasn't necessary in a multi-repository, right? And last but not least, what is also good to note is that the level of flexibility that we offer with the customer requests, the customizations, the deadlines that connect to that, it kind of demanded us sometimes to update individual customers, which led to these version differences on, on different customer platforms, which ultimately then, were led, then led to support and scalability issues. You know, if a ticket came in, it was really hard to understand um, the root cause analysis uh, or, or actually perform the root cause analysis because it could be on a different version. It could be that it's fixed in a newer version. The customer just needed an update, but the update couldn't go through because another extension was missing compatibility. So we kind of put ourselves into this, uh, or we grew ourselves into this uh, big pain pot. So we needed to fix this. So this year after DrupalCon North America in Portland, uh, we were working uh, remote with a couple of colleagues and myself in San Francisco, uh, and we were discussing these pain points. Uh, and we came up with Project Cable Car. The working title uh, named after the famous cable cars riding around in San Francisco. And we set ourselves uh, out to fix these pain points. So what did we want to achieve? One of the bigger things is we wanted to get ownership. We are all working on open social as a product, even though it's an extensions or an open source, but it felt like we were all siloed and focused on solving a specific need instead of enhancing the product. We also needed more predictability and quality focus, as I'd like to say, and, and reduce the amount of production issues coming out of this uh, big pain point. So with more structure for releases towards customers, even though that means sometimes they have to wait a little longer as the development is not necessarily going slower, but is released in a slower pace towards them, that would give us more control. We would gain back control uh, on our predictability there. There would also be no reason for us anymore to have our customers out of sync. You know, with all of these variations and extensions we offered, the quick cycles of adding value, a lot of the work came together for us on a deploy, which is quite right on this, on this image that you see. Uh, and it's, we noticed that it's way too late for us. We wanted to shift that left, right? Um, more to the left, more to the early stages. The earlier that we encountered the impact or the potential problems, the, less costly it is for us to solve. And a monorepo would help us with this. Um, with a monorepo, we would at least also know everything and everyone is on the same version from the same source, giving us more control, not per se in reducing the amount of production issue, but control in either helping out with the root cause analysis, because everybody will have the same version. So we don't really need that administration layer of checking which version and if it's already fixed or prioritize the tickets because we know that there's maybe potentially five people with the same issue or write tests to make sure that it never happens again because now 
we have the opportunity where extensions are running next to each other in the same source. So we can have them test, testing together, basically. So ultimately, this monorepo will give us the tools to set ourselves up for success. And that's something that resonated the most with me personally, is that with the monorepo, we can also focus a lot of our efforts on tooling and, and do even more than what we're just thinking about. You know, we just started this. So how did we do this? Actually, going from a multi to a monorepo is a matter of moving all of your projects into a single repository, right? That's that's the only thing. So we've created a bash script based on all of the extensions that we have, and the magic is just native Git. So I think the most magical is the Git retree, and it allows you to merge information into an existing index, giving all files a prefixed file path for the merge. Fancy words for it allows you to merge a project into a new mono repository, specify a new path for its files, and make sure that the history and the files reflect that new path correctly. In our case, that became HTML modules extensions. It also allowed us to do some cleanup. You know, we don't need the Bitbucket pipelines or GitHub actions per extension. It's just now in a mono repo, so we only need it once and we could clean it up. And we have our first mono repo release. You know, at the time of writing uh, the proposal for DrupalCon uh, Prague, we were barely starting on a proof of concept and now we have our first release. So we don't really have the results yet of how this is going, but at least we want to share with you uh, some of the lessons that we've learned along the way. Um, luckily, we also didn't have to do everything from scratch. So I want to highlight uh, two tools that really stood out and helped us. Uh, first of all, made by the creator of PHP Rector. It's a tool called the Mono Repo Builder. Um, it helps you in all of the aspects of maintaining a mono repo, from releasing to migration, to dependency management, to uh, automation. Um, it's all symphony based, so you can plug and play away with all of the knowledge uh, your organization might already have uh, with working with Drupal and Symfony. Um, it's, it's really key for, for our work. Um, and we didn't really discuss how we install our dependencies at Open Social on our customer sites. It's not necessarily something for the mono repo debate. Um, but I do want to bring this to the presentation uh, as a tip for you to work with private packages. Uh, it's by the creators of Composer, um, and it allowed us to easily switch from serving our projects from the multi-repo towards the mono-repo, and even have, the, have a way to support either or. So we could have a customer still on the mono-repo while working um, still on the multi-repository while already releasing others on the mono-repo. Um, and it also ensured we could roll back easily and make that switch. But I think the biggest lesson we've learned and are still learning is the new mental model. Um, because our entry point of development was usually always one extension, either a new or an existing one. And from there, we could work our way through the product. Now our entry point is the monorepo. It's basically the entire product. Even though it's a good thing and it helps us with what we want to achieve, you know, that mental model change is something you shouldn't underestimate. And with that in mind, you need, really need to plan this because the technical implementation is very likely the easiest. The, the change in development pace, the migration or switch to the monorepo for your customers, the planning, the new mental model is likely the bigger impact of this all. We don't have any data yet. At least that's what we took into consideration. And I feel like we did that right. Um, so ultimately, is a monorepo something for you? Question mark. Looking at Facebook, Google, Netflix, uh, Uber, uh, or a little closer to home, Symfony, I think they all use mono repositories. So it must be the best approach, right? Hopefully by now it's clear there is no one size fits all answer. It all depends on your requirements. The best approach may well change over time, even for us. And I think key is to keep in mind that these strategies will ultimately change your organization or a reflection of your organization. So make sure that your organization is ready for this change and it changes it for the better. So before we dive into the questions, I want to take a moment to bring your attention to the contribution opportunities. Helping out is greatly appreciated. And I would be super grateful if you could let me know any feedback you might have about this presentation. And now it's time for questions. 